We are lucky today to be joined by Jeff Schaefer, of course, that's why you're all here. Um, I'm Benjamin Lindsay, Managing Editor at Backstage. Um, yeah, we're, we're happy to have you joining us today. Um, yeah. To give a quick intro while any, the, the waiting room continues to uh, file out, a uh, quick intro on Jeff. Uh, he's established himself as one of the key players in the world of comedy television, from Seinfeld to Curb Your Enthusiasm to The League and now Newcomer Dave, which if you haven't seen it, it just broke the record on FX as its most watched comedy ever. Um, so uh, no small feat, certainly. Um, and Dave is uh, the show that Jeff is showrunner on while simultaneously being the showrunner on the rebooted Curb Your Enthusiasm. So plenty to talk about. Um, that's all in addition to producing, writing, directing across film. I mean, Euro Trip, Borat, to name two major ones. Um, and it's such a treat to have him here today. So we will be starting this session for a uh, little interview uh, between Jeff and myself. And then we're going to take it and open it up to audience questions. Um, if you're new to the platform of Zoom, new to these kind of sessions that Backstage is hosting, I'll give a quick tutorial at that 20 minute mark when we're done with the interview and then we can go from there. But uh, for now, I'll turn it over to Jeff. Jeff, you, Jeff, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you and thank you for the highlights. Uh, low lights are available upon request also. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> if go you to want to hear thing. about all the mistakes. <laughs> um, now, uh, we were kind of talking before the, the waiting room let out, but were you in the middle of production when this whole shutdown happened? No, I was very lucky in that, uh, all the shows I had done basically finished shooting in the fall. So uh, Curb, was, Curb was actually starting to air. Um, the show I did for Netflix was done. The Dave was still in editing. So the final, the final episode of Dave, we had to do remotely. We had to edit remotely. We had to sound mix remotely. We had to color remotely, which just took so much longer. And so it's just, you know, it's easy if everyone's there and you say, let me see it again, let's see it again, let's try this, let's try that. Um, but having to, especially with the sound mixes, because even if we got all together over Zoom, we could talk about the quality of the sound, but we couldn't, the timing is off. Right. If the timing's off just a little bit, you're done. So we had to like keep giving notes, looking at something, writing it down, writing down notes, looking at something, it just took forever. Yeah, man, well, it's definitely not an easy time for anyone, but as a creative in the industry, Trying to get all those ducks in a row can't be easy. Um, no. But I was very lucky. I mean, look, a lot of people were either about to shoot, they'd done all of this, like my, my friend uh, Alec Berg, you know, he, he was just about to start off with Barry again. They were two mm -hmm. weeks away from shooting. And then all of a sudden it's like, nope. So um, I'm actually very fortunate that everything was basically done. Yeah, I mean, the repercussions of the productions that either got shut down or didn't even get to start on their uh, upcoming seasons, it's going to be felt for the next year at least, it's incredible. Um, now I, I am really interested, you're, you're talking about, you as a showrunner have your hands in so many pots, um, just talking about even the sound editing and whatnot, that's not necessarily what you started as, you were in the writer's room. Um, and I'd love to pick your brain a bit on how you built yourself from the writer's room to being the, the producer, to being the guy who uh, kind of oversees it all. So what, what was your first writing job? My first writing job, uh, my partner Alec Berg and I, um, we got a job on a sketch show for the Fledgling Fox Network, and we shot six of them, and they never aired. And then we had a job writing um, one episode of a new sitcom starring an unknown actor named Toby McGuire called Great Scott with these two great writers, Tom Gamble and Max Pross. And that show was getting canceled. By the time our script was being shot, it was basically they were tearing down the sets. Mm -hmm. So that one never aired. And then we had a job on another show for Fox starring an unknown comic named Jeff Garland um, with Whit Thomas, shot six of those, that never aired. So I had 13 episodes of television with real craft service, real cameras, real everything, and it was never on TV. Wow. People would ask you, what do you do? And I'd say, oh, I'm a TV writer. And they go, oh, anything I've seen? No. <laughs> Nobody's seen it. <laughs> no. no one has ever seen it. No one will ever see them. Um, so those were, that was like a year of working in just, and just all of it just sitting in a bin somewhere. Yeah, um, yeah. But in terms of learning how to go from writer to producer or you know, and director and 
showrunner. That all started with Seinfeld because yep. Larry and Jerry, when it was your episode, you were in on casting. You were there on the floor. You were in the edit room. You went to the sound mix. You went to the, you got to go to all of these things. And they would, I used to say to Larry, he just suffered the death of a thousand cuts because Alec and I would be there going, what about this? What about this? How do you do this? So, you know, for two years we learned under Larry and then Larry left, you know, for the last two years of Seinfeld and then we had to do it. Right. So, but all of the skills, whether from all the skills that we needed as a director and as a showrunner, we learned there. It was kind of an education while doing it, while yeah. seeing it firsthand. On the, on the job training. Yeah, yeah. Now, now bringing us up to uh, your two showrunning jobs, On Dave and the reboot of Curb, um, is, are those two projects happening simultaneously? Or what's the actual calendar look like for you? The, well, there's what the calendar was ideally going to look like, and then there's what the calendar usually ends up looking like, which is you think you're going to actually make this really elaborate sort of Jenga p puzzle of your schedule and then some things push and some things go early and then yeah there's an overlap so um I set up the I set up the writer's room uh oh did I just did I just cut myself off hold on no you're here oh, there we go okay I actually hit my keyboard and it went I was like oh no um so I set up the writer's room for Dave across the street from the curb editings is what mm -hmm. I, is what I did so I would end up running back and forth um through the four lanes of traffic in the median of Olympic in West LA, mm -hmm. um, like a sort of showrunner frogger. And so I would meet with the writers in the morning and then run over to edit with Larry and then come back. If, and so it just sort of go back and forth that way. Um, so that was, that was pretty tricky. And we, sh I mean, the pilot we shot, Curb ended up pushing, so end up a few months, so we shot the pilot of Dave and that, and then shot like some reshoots over the Christmas break of shooting Curb. So it's been a big, sort of just uh, work stew. Basically. A juggling act, certainly, yeah. Now, what, what's it like for you to be working on two series at the same time that tonally, obviously they're both comedies, but within that genre, they're both pretty drastically different. Um, it must be pretty fulfilling for you to be able to explore different facets of, of your humor in that way. Yeah, I mean, they're both, they're, they're remarkably similar in a few ways. One is that they both have a lead who knows exactly who he is. Mm -hmm. which is a huge help. Um, we weren't quite sure what the show of Dave was yet, and it grew. It's, you watch it evolve as you watch the series. Um, but both of them aren't going to strike wrong notes as actors, mm -hmm. which makes dealing with performances easier. Um, and there's a lot of improv in both. So Larry improvises as Larry, and he's true to Larry. And Dave Bird, who's also a great improviser, improvises as Dave Bird. So there's you don't have false notes. You don't have to go, wait, you wouldn't do that. That's not how you would do that. Mm -hmm. so that's how they would do it. Um, so that makes things, that made things a lot easier. Yeah, yeah. I actually didn't realize that Dave is uh, largely improvised in a similar way that Curb is. It's, well, the end was, here's the thing. There's, there's a script for Dave, which is different than Curb where we have an outline, but um, there is a lot of improvising on set. Mm -hmm. And I think I, which is how I prefer to work anyway, the script is the script are some lines you can do, but let's try other things. Let's try as many things as we can. Let's get, let's get all of the great things we can, the great diversions, the things we didn't expect to shoot that day. You said that, wait, oh, that's funny. Let's try this. That's what shooting is, gathering all of this stuff and then writing it for a final time in the edit room. And so the script is a version, but we never push the actors to say exactly this. You always know you can fall back to it. Yeah. If there's a line you really want, say it. As opposed to, I think most shows... Um, start with the script, got to get the script. Mm -hmm. And then improv is relegated to like, you know, this sort of spinning your wheels, looking for an out. Mm -hmm. And I find that unproductive and I don't think you get the best stuff. I'd rather have people say it the way they want to say it. And that means the actors are listening. Because if you don't know what the other person's going to say, you have to listen. And if you have to listen, it actually seems like people are talking. When it seems like people are talking, it seems like real life. Yeah. So, so is that kind of the first thing on an actor's... Uh toolkit that you look for? You look for training at the groundlings, for instance? Um, it's, it is funny how many, I would say there are a lot of very, very funny people and there are some very funny comedians who are not great at improv, who are not good on curb, or mm -hmm. they're not good because they're just trying to get their jokes in. Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh, you're not flexible. You're not being nimble. You're not listening to what Larry's saying. Like, I mean, when Larry's on set, and we'll talk about how we do curb, but Larry has an amazing ability to act and write at the same time. So sometimes he'll just, we'll be in the scene and he'll just go, and he'll start laughing. 
and he's laughing at what he's about to do <laughs> about the the wrench that he's about to throw into this right but like and sometimes people just don't like he's casting a line and sometimes people aren't catching it and mm -hmm. so we'll see him go around again and then i'll go then he starts to get frustrated and i'll go hold on hold on hold on try this try this try this because you can see what larry's trying to do and the person if the person's too in their own world too involved in i gotta say this joke mm -hmm. You're not in the scene anymore. You're actually an obstruction to the scene because we're taking this in a different direction. Right, right. Um, and, you know, with Curb, we don't rehearse. We rehearse for blocking, but it, we literally say blah, blah, blah. Blah, 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 come over here. Blah, 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 person enters. Blah, blah, blah. Because Larry wants it all to be fresh. That's great, yeah. Fresh. Um, of course, you know, it's sort of my job to make sure everybody knows what's going on and like, I'll take, I'll find the actors, whether it's in the, um, in the makeup trailer or before the scene and sort of, Hey, you might want to try this. You might want to try that. Mm -hmm. Basically loading them up. Um, like I'll talk to JB and he'll go, I think I want to do this. Go, Oh wait, yeah, try this, try that. So I have to make a decision. If I know what he's going to say is going to be really funny. I've got to ch change the cameras from an over to a single of like JB, because when Larry hears it for the first time, his first reaction, if it's funny is to laugh and ruin the take. So mm -hmm. I have to make sure that his shoulders aren't literally ruining JB's goal. Right. <laughs> um, and that's how the show, I'm always whispering in people's ears. I'll walk, I'm walking around the set talking to the cameras and also just whispering to the actors. Larry doesn't want to know what they're going to say. Mm -hmm. So he's just surprised. And we that. just, yeah. And so, so every scene is a live rewrite, um, which I really enjoy. And for the whole crew behind the camera, it must keep it alive in a very unique way, in a way that isn't necessarily seen across the board in comedies. Oh, no, it's, it's, the crew has a great time because no one knows what's going to happen. Right. Um, I remember we, two seasons ago, we shot a musical with Lin-Manuel Miranda and there were dancers and everything. And everyone was like, oh my God, that must have been so difficult to shoot. I was like, that was the easy one. Dancers do the same thing every time. The music's the same every time. Everyone knows where they're going to be and what they're going to say. Right. That was the easiest time we had the whole time. Usually, I have a hopeful idea. You're going to be supposed to be over here, but things change. You have a plan, and then you get ready to throw that plan out the window every day. Yeah, yeah. So, so what advice do you have for actors that you're casting, for first-timers new to the show, whether it be Dave or Curb? Um, it sounds like you're kind of, in some ways, throwing them into the deep end. So how do you expect them to, to keep up? What, what advice do you have for them? Listen. Mm. Listen to what's really being said. That's, that's the thing. Be in the scene. We'll, we're always a safety net. Like, we're a safety net. I'm a safety net for jokes, safety net for position, safety net for everything else. Just do it. Yeah. Just, we'll, steer, we'll steer it. You're, we're going to keep steering it and changing it and modifying it until we get the shape of the scene that we like. Um, and, you know, on, on a scripted show like Dave, some of it, you know, a lot of it may follow that, but a lot of it may not. On Curb, where there's an outline, we'll, we, will, we, will fit, we, will find, we will find it. I mean, all the time is taken writing the, let's put it this way, Curb, The League, Seinfeld, they're all written the exact same way. Mm -hmm. The exact same way. Come up with funny stories, and then with the dry erase board, sit there and do this comedy geometry to try and wrestle all these stories into intersections and consequences that come to uh, like a fun um, denouement. So once you have that, on Seinfeld, we spend a few days writing the script. On Curb, we don't. The League was a combination just because there were six people and I wanted to put more of the jokes. I was like, I just put them, why don't I just put them in the script so I remember them? Mm -hmm. But we'll do some of them, some of them we won't. We're gonna come up with new ones, but like, once you've done the outline, once you've done the hard work, which is the outline, the rest is just get funny people to say it however you want. Let's just keep fooling around with that until we yeah. get all these versions we love. And That's then you write it for the third and final time in the edit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're really putting a lot of trust into your actors in an interesting way. I like that. Now, what they love it too. It is. You trust that you're gonna sh we're all just going to show up today and go, you know what? We're funny people. We're going to come up with something really funny. Mm -hmm. And they trust... And the set is always loose and the set is always fun. And you want people to do crazy stuff. And you want people, I mean, there's so many times like on the league where someone would say, oh, we can't do that. And go, oh no, we're going to do that. And we're going to do this further. And they trust that you're going to use the best stuff. Mm. And we trust that they're going to, that we're all going to come up with great stuff together. Yeah, certainly. Well, what, what's your uh, writing process look like today? Are you able to 
be working at all, given the state of the world? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I would say <laughs> for Curb, I usually say that like documenting like the the bad behavior of the west side of Los Angeles is an evergreen business. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it's harder when you're not out like experiencing all these people or making a fool of yourself. Mm -hmm. um, but Larry and I have a pretty deep reservoir <laughs> and stuff, new stuff is happening all the time, right? I mean, we're, we reflect the, the environment we're in. So yeah, you're, I mean, there's still lots of, there's just, there's just new social constructs, right? Zoom calls and mm -hmm. group text chains and, you know, who, who swears they've been completely isolated, but got a haircut clearly, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I mean, there's, there's, there's a world of stuff still out there. Um, so Larry and I are, are, I would say we're talking about talking about another season. Yeah, excellent. All right. I mean, I, I am probably not alone on this Zoom right now, but I think having an episode to see Larry respond to uh, wearing a mask outside or just dealing with the current constraints of the world, that's, uh, that's comedic right there. You know, it's so funny. I mean, for, I would say, two seasons, we've played around with the idea of someone wearing a mask Mm -hmm. like pitching it somewhere. We, and it was just like, eh, everyone always pitched it. And so it just felt like, it felt common before. It was like so many people thought about it. And it was like, oh, well, so many people thought about it, we don't want to do it. Now, the trick for us is if we were to do another season, you have to, you have to think ahead. Like what's the weather going to be like in a year or a year and mm -hmm. a half? Cause you don't know when you're going to shoot. Right. Yet. And you know, the shooting takes about six months and then the editing is going to take another five months. So you're talking about a year from when you shoot, you're coming out. Yeah. And you don't want to be so timely now that you're out of touch later. Right. So right. we've had a lot of talks about this and I think you can, and there's tricks you can do. I mean, you can certainly look back on some bad behavior and things of like things that happened, but like, you can't write it like we're right now because it may be a year and a half before we see it. You don't want to be, I don't know. You don't want to be the last person to the dinner table either. Right. Right. No, that's all fair. And, uh, pretty extraordinary circumstances and considerations that you have to be making along the way. Yeah. Um, but definitely excited to see what you do next and where all this brings you. Um, I mean, here's the thing. Larry was, we were, Larry was way ahead of the curve, if I may. I mean, you know, he, he opened a restaurant. He put Purell on every table. Mm -hmm. He didn't want people <laughs> defecating in there. I mean, right. I don't know how much more he had to tell you about what was coming. <laughs> he was on the pulse. He was on the pulse. Yeah. Definitely. Um, Awesome. Well, if you don't mind, I'll open it up to some audience questions here. Um, thank you again for joining us today, Dave and Curb Your Enthusiasm, two excellent pieces of television. And if people are in this Zoom right now and haven't seen them, they're all obviously available to stream and now's the time to do it. So take advantage of that. Um, now to uh, take advantage of this Q&A session, uh, what you're going to want to do, and I see some people in the waiting room already have, you're going to want to use the raise your hand feature in the bottom right hand of your or bottom right hand corner of your screen, and that'll pop you up on my screen. I'm going to scroll through, moderate questions to ask a question. We are recording, so I ask that you have your camera on, so we have that nice face-to-face -face interaction. And uh, please uh, be respectful of uh, that shared time here. Just one question each, and uh, we'll make our way down the line and see see what we can get in between now and the hour. But uh, I will start with let's scroll through here um let's see how about michelle sewell for question number one michelle you're off mute hi um hi jeff nice to see you nice to meet you <laughs> um you. so i actually have a kind of um so my question is basically so you write you produce and you direct which are all different career paths all different choices um out of all of those which one's your favorite um the direct, well, here's the thing. When you're directing, you're writing, when I'm directing, I'm writing and producing. Okay. So, and I didn't start out like going, when I started doing this, I didn't go, oh, I want to be a director. Or I want to be a producer. Like I even knew what that was. I just knew I wanted to be a writer. But as you get more and more, like a lot of producers are just writers with more authority, right? And eventually you become a showrunner. You basically get enough, you have enough authority to, to cause yourself problems. So that's, <laughs> that's, and in terms of directing, it was just sort of the natural extension of like, I want it to look like this, well, why don't I just do it? Um, and especially for the shows that I do, they're so, they're so writing intensive on set that not having a, like, 
I would be doing it anyway. Like I'm, you're just like on set with Curb, you know, I'm just writing with Larry. We're going, no, no, we're do this, do this, do this, do this. Then you push him back out. So it just felt like a natural extension of it because you know what you want it to look like. You know what it's going to be funny. Um, so I sort of slid into that just by wanting to, I slid into the directing and the producing by wanting to finish what I started, I guess is the easiest way to put it. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for your question, Michelle. Um, next, we're going to go over to Treya Dene. Treya, you're off mute. Hi. How are you? Good. Um, good. I was wondering, you talked about how, you know, you'd never kind of say, oh, we can't do that, and then you'd go ahead and do it and push further. Has there ever been a time when you're like, ah, oh, it's too big, we're just, no. Do you have a limit for that kind of thing? I mean, I, interesting. I always say I know where the line is because I can look back and see it. Um, <laughs> I, I think, you know, I like making things where, I mean, my favorite thing is you're watching your on set and you just, you know, turn to the scripty or something and you just go, you don't see that on TV every day. Um, that's what I'm trying to do. So we're always pushing. Um, yeah, there's always, I mean, there's always things. I mean, there's always things that we're not going to use. I just go, oh, we can't, we're not using that. Either because it's like, just like, even in a curb scene, there may be like four different digressions. And this one, one is way better than the others. And then sometimes there's just crazy stuff. I mean, like on the league, Jason Manzukas, who's one of the funniest human beings on the planet. He had this character, Rafi, who's just a character with zero governor. But he would, always, Jason always wanted to talk about how his character was very good friends with Johan von der Sloot, the person who murdered that woman in Aruba. And, <laughs> and it's like, yeah, and he calls him, he would always call him JVS. And he'd be in the scene and then he'd start talking about, oh yeah, then me and JVS. I'm like, no, we're not doing JVS today. Like, like <laughs> we're just not today. Um, but usually I think you can talk about and do anything. It's about how you do it. And and it's sometimes it's risky and sometimes, but that's, you gotta, you, I don't know, we always try it. It's just, to me, it's all about execution. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Trina. Um, Yeah, in terms of that line, I think specifically of some of your work, I mean, Borat was so boundary pushing for its time. Bruno, all, all your work along those lines. Um, is that ever a goal that you set out to do, to, to be pushing the line, pushing the boundary in that way? I think you're setting out to do something really funny. Mm. And if it's extreme, that's fine. I mean, there's, there's a lot of funny stuff that's not extreme. There's a lot of funny stuff that is extreme. But I mean, Sasha, you know, Sasha's just a brave motherfucker. He's just always <laughs> pushing the boundaries, right? And yeah. but for Sasha, it's always, you know, the, the victims, like there needs to be a point. Like he always was, he wasn't looking to punk people. He was looking to punk people that needed to get punked. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a lot, always a lot of discussion about that of like, we're not like, let's make sure we have a point here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, awesome. Let's go over to Gabriella Jones. Gabriella, you are off mute. Hi, Mr. Schaefer. Thank you so much for just your breadth of work. I want to say I had no idea that you did the league. You've done Borat. Curb your enthusiasm. I grew up with, um, I recently finished watching the first season of Dave and I cried pretty much through the entire second to last episode. Um, I've been a huge fan of Lil Dicky for the past few years. My partner and I were always joking about certain, you know, lines within his songs. One of them being, um, you know, bitch don't know Pangea. Um, excuse my French, but uh, my question is, as an aspiring actress um, who absolutely adores everything that you've done, especially Dave, um, what would your thoughts be in terms of trying to get noticed by casting for that particular show in particular? Um, let's see. Well, two things. One, I should clear one thing up. Borat, Alec Berg, and Dave Mandel and I just came in and helped with the end. Like, we just came in and, like, I, I traveled around the world with him on Bruno, but I can take, Borat was, was Aunt and Peter and, and Sasha. We just came in and helped a little bit. Um, but in terms, of, uh, in terms of casting for that, I think we had a very, the North Star for the show was authenticity. So it was, especially for Dave, and Dave Bird himself very much wanted things to feel very real, hyper real, he would always say. Yeah slice of life. So in the casting process too, it was, that feels too sitcom -y. That person feels like 
they're pushing away. That person feels like they're trying to be funny. We want sort of people that are just low key real. I don't know. It's like, you know, so it's, it's, it was this, it was, um, a, it's a very specific, it's a very specific mantra that goes throughout the whole thing for that. And I think that's actually why the show sort of worked is cause it like the vulnerability and everything felt real. Um, and the things he's saying are real. I mean, whether it's Dave or whether it's Gata talking about his bipolar stuff, which is real, like, and I gotta say, I mean, the, the bravery that they showed to be that vulnerable, not hiding behind a character, right? They're not playing someone else. They're playing basically versions of themselves. And they're saying, this is me. This is really like in front of the camera. Uh, I thought it was just like very impressive. Yeah. No, it was simply beautiful. And, you know, I could only wish to be a part of that. It was just thank you for putting it out there. Thank oh, you. You're very welcome. By the way, how great was Taylor in that breakup episode? I mean, her oh my God. She was amazing. Amazing. <sighs> amazing. Amazing. And then watching him, sorry if I'm spoiling this for anyone, I'm so sorry, but watching him drive home and just, I had no idea Dave Bird was such an amazing actor. <laughs> like, I didn't think Lil Dicky was an actor. I, I seriously, like, I was skeptical the first couple of episodes. I, I really didn't know what to think. And then just seeing him, like you're saying, just be himself and being so authentic and loving him even more for that, it was beautiful. He, grew, so, he definitely grew into it, which is, I think, why the show got better and better. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Great question. Um, Next, let's go over to Zora Cruz. Zora, you are off mute. Hi. Um, well, thanks for doing this backstage and thanks, Jeff, for being here. This is so awesome. Um, I have grown up watching Seinfeld and Love Curb, um, and it's inspired a lot of like what I'm trying to do because I feel like I'm also an actor who writes um, and thinks about producing. I guess my question is around like, having a reverent material and trying to figure out where it fits. Cause I wrote uh, and starred in a film and I've just been like submitting it to festivals, which ironically are not happening right now. <laughs> um, and just like film labs. And I feel like part of the trick is the material. Like I think that line is there and I'm just wondering like how to get a reverent work out into the world. like. Well, I mean, here's the thing. You have the ability now, I mean, everyone does, that people didn't have even 15 years ago to just make stuff, right? I mean, and if you're a writer, there's no substitute for writing. If you want to direct, there's no substitute for actually directing. It's, these are, they're, they're skills that you get better at, right? I always say it's like building a barrel. If you gave me a whole bunch of wood and you said build a barrel, my first barrel would stink, right? And so, but eventually I'd figure out what pieces go where and how to apportion things. And, and so, but in terms of like, the irreverent stuff, I think it's, it will land better when it feels like it's coming from a real place. So it's not just, bah, there it is. Mm -hmm. It's not just, that, that's more of a sketch. Mm -hmm. I think it's better when that kind of comedy stuff comes from character. So it's like the character driven comedy. Why are they in that situation? How do they get there? Oh my God, this person is like so screwed up mentally or they can't get out of their own way. Because of what? Because of what? Because of what? Oh, that's why. So you enjoy it because it's not just, it's not just, just throwing out the joke. You're actually seeing why it's like that. So you actually, mm -hmm. you get a big laugh, and you also go, oh my god, this poor idiot, you know, or whatever you want him to feel. Right, so right. Better. That stuff is always better when it's tied, anchored, I should say, to the character. Okay. Yeah. Because I feel like. I feel like I'm so rooted in the character, but I think what is missing a little bit is the backstory of like how she got there, of like what her antics are all about. Well, by the way, and here's the thing, you have to figure out, you don't have to know everything at once either. It's better to learn and learn and learn, but like hint at things. You don't have to tell everybody everything in the beginning, but it's nice mm -hmm. to hint at something. I don't know what that is. Oh, and then you learn, right? You're sort of, you're sort of, you're sort of figuring it out. It's, and again, that's part of, portioning out story. That's part of building mm -hmm. that barrel and figuring out how much do you let in and how much do you, how much you let the audience in on what's going on. Right. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I think to answer, like, 
you're sort of, it's a hard question to ask, answer because you're sort of asking, well, when are, when are really, when are jokes funny? And it's like, well, they're funny when they're set up right and when they're based in character, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That help? Yeah, I, I think I'm just gonna like keep trying, but I'm also wondering if like, right now is the space for rewrites or um, I'll tell you, just I mean, right like now, fleshing out. This is a great, I mean, for everybody, I mean, this is a great time to like, oh, you have a pause here. Take a look at it. What do you like? What do you not like? I mean, even though it's, even if it's filmed and edited, it's still, I mean, it's still, a, everything's a rough draft till you, till you get it out there, right? True. So, so you can always take a look at it. What don't you like? Oh, I wish it was like this. Well, then make it like that. And mm -hmm. sometimes, um, like Alec and Dave and I, when we would write together, we would outline and then we'd split stuff up and just put it back all together because we would try and get to what we called a shit draft as fast <laughs> as possible. Because then you look at the shit draft and you go, ah, this is just wrong. I wish it was like this. Right. And you go, oh, we should make it like that. So it's easier to get, <laughs> we just get mad at it. We just be able to, <laughs> it's easier to get mad at the thing on paper than it is to just get mad theoretically. Mm -hmm. So you've got something now, you yeah. know, have people look at it. What do they like? What do they not like? What are they getting? What aren't they understanding? What's missing? Take that advice and then, and then you know, and use it to reshape it. Cool. Thank you. Awesome. Welcome. Thanks for the question, Zora. Um, next up, we're going to go over to Sarah. Sarah, you are off mute. Hi. How are you? Good. Okay. I love Seinfeld. It's my favorite show. So I was just wondering, um, like in a care, or, sorry, in a show that's so driven by interesting choice of characters, do you write these beforehand and have try to find people who fit similarly to the characters you have in mind? Or do you just audition a bunch of people and try to see who's just an interesting character to begin with and then go based on that? For, it depends. For Seinfeld, we definitely wrote the scripts first and then would just audition. And you may have someone in mind that would be perfect for this, or what about this? Oh, this person, or, but it was, it was more, the writing came first and then we would cast. Um, sometimes for Curb, we'll think of, there's people that we would love that we wanted to use like this year, like we wrote a part and it was like, oh, Isla Fisher will be great for that. And she was, but then at the same time, there's other times where we were just writing and Larry and I heard that Clive Owen really loved the show. And we were working on this, we had this one idea and we're like, Clive Owen, who we never even thought had heard of the show. Like, why would he ever, he's a movie star. I was like, oh, that would be hilarious if he did this part. Would he do this part? And he would. So sometimes we get lucky and it's an incoming phone call from people we would have never expected. And then sometimes we're just, we're chasing. Um, but like, <laughs> like with that Lynn Mar manuel Miranda year two seasons ago, we had basically written the entire season before we bothered to ask if Lynn was available. <laughs> And we very wisely had no plan B. So I'm not, and so he goes, we go, hey, we're starting, we, you know, we start to shoot in like September. And he goes, oh, perfect. The beginning of September is right when I go to London to do Mary Poppins for six months. Like, oh, okay. Uh, but I'm interested. So we got him one day when he was coming back for the Oscars, we got to shoot. And then the rest of it, we just had to shoot. Like, I think we ended up shooting like in July or August when he was all done. It was the only way we could do it. And by the way, how have you, where did you start seeing Seinfeld? Because it obviously was not even, it was done well before you were born. Yeah, um, my dad and I watch it because he, well, they got it for me for Christmas when I was like 10 and I didn't want to watch it, but they knew it was like my type of humor. So every time I go home from college, my dad and I watch it on breaks. Amazing, amazing. That's great. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. And Jeff, I love that. Sometimes you got to operate without a plan B to, <laughs> to make it happen. You just yeah. got to run into the sun a little bit. Yeah. Yep. Um, next question we'll take from Amanda. Amanda, you are off mute. Hi, thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Thank you for this. Of course. Um, Jeff, I want to say that you've been such a huge inspiration to me. Um, I've been a writer and actress for 15 years. I uh, went and got three bachelor's degree in creative writing and acting. Um, and my question is, um, when you have your polished finished script, your baby, and you're, you know you're gonna be confident in it and you wanna release it, 
how do you go about doing that? Do you have advice about where to go from here? Um, well, let's start with, let's start with, I'm sure it's, let's start with the moment where you're sure it's ready. Um, Cause there's a few pieces of advice I always give with that. One is read it out loud. Because when you spend all this time writing, your mind will, and you're reading it, you're reading it, your mind will conflate it, it'll lie, it'll skip over things. And if you read it out loud, you'll realize mistakes you made like, oh, she said not married there. No, she's married. Or this is the wrong person. Or also, this doesn't sound like regular speech. So I always tell people right before, before you're done, please read it out loud. It, will, it forces you to literally confront everything on the page. Um, and then in terms of what to do with it, um, that's sort of the, the holy grail question, right? I mean, I think for all writers, it's always, you're doing two different things at the same time. You're writing and working on your writing, and then you're meeting as many people as humanly possible. And you're, yeah. what you're trying to do is have those two things intersect so that when this is ready, the writing is ready, and someone says, hey, I'd like to see what you've written, you can just make the connection. So I guess, and they can happen simultaneously, right? They, these things can happen simultaneously. Um, yeah. It is meeting a manager or meeting someone in production, um, meeting another writer. I don't know. It's like, hey, can you read this? And every time you have a meeting with someone, I think it's try to get another meeting out of it. Is there anyone they know? Like they say, oh, I have a friend, whatever. Like someone hands me a drama script. I'm not, I can, I can judge this, but I'm not really, I'm not really in that world, but I have a friend who, that kind of thing. So um, there's no, there's no right answer to how to get, <laughs> like it, it's all, things only work out that way in hindsight, right? There's, right. oh, that worked out. Like there's never, you never had the plan. This is going to work out. You just, you don't know. You don't know who's going to, you know, it's, that's the, the thing about it. So there's, there's no way to do it, but the surest way to maximize your success is to work on your own stuff and then meet as many people as you can that, and hopefully that will get you in touch with someone who can be as helpful to you, be helpful to you when you need it. Perfect. Thank you so much. That makes me feel better. Now I know I'm on the right track. <laughs> Thank Good. you. You're welcome. That's great. Thank you, Amanda. Um, next question. Let's go over to Mike Weber. Mike, you are off mute. Thank you. Having a little latte Larry's here. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. So one of the most challenging things I've ever had to do was do background on curb and keep a straight face sitting like two seats away from Larry. Um, I was in the sushi restaurant and I was just dying. But which, uh, which this season? Yeah, this last season. Oh, with the, uh, the, the heavier couple that wanted to sit? Was it that one? Oh, no, no. Oh. It was the, uh, it was, it was in Hamasushi in Venice. Yeah, exactly. That was yeah. fun. Um, so my question is for co-star and guest star roles, um, even if like it's a co-star role and it's just a couple lines, do you try and uh, cast those out of the improv community since there is so much improv on the show or does it matter? Uh, it does matter. Um, usually, for almost every role, I mean, Larry has traditionally wanted, I mean, you read with Larry in the audition. Right. So people will come in and they give a little slip of paper and sometimes it's exactly what the scene is and sometimes it's like the scene but to the left of it so we don't give away, giving things away. And, and you're in there doing the scene with Larry. Now, depending, as we get deeper into production um, and for smaller roles, we often rely on either like I may say, oh, I know someone who's, you know, just having done, lived in the sort of improvised world for a long time. Oh, this person, I know someone who'd be perfect for this. And sometimes our, our casting people, uh, Allison, you know, with Allison Jones, will say, send us some reels. Or sometimes they'll actually audition, like they'll come in and audition. But a lot of times, I, if, especially if we're in a crunch or it's a new part and we don't have the time, just send me some reels. Let me look at the, I'd rather look at reels sometimes than an audition for something that's not the show, personally. Because um, at least with the real, I can see more of the breadth of the, the experience of, and more of what they can do. Um, but, uh, but if it's a bigger part, chances are you're coming in and reading with Larry. Now, is that gonna change if we do another season with, you know, with 
you know, big bad Corona, I have, I, I imagine there may be less one-on-one -on -one auditions, but they're helpful for us too. Uh, because Larry's in there improvising, so we often, or he's saying something like, oh, we should do this or we should do that. So it's basically like a little rehearsal sometimes for those scenes. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, thanks, Mike. I'm gonna go over to Jessica Schur. Jessica, you are off mute. Okay, hi there. Uh, hello from New York. Uh, we're here on the Upper West Side quarantining. Um, I was just curious to know, I do come from the, imp uh, the improv world. How do you go about with uh, continuity? If you have an actor doing something awesome and amazing, uh, how do you go about with the technical side of it to make sure you can go back and get it again? Um, that's a very good question. So when we're shooting, there's things you have to, I'm actually, it's more than that that we're looking out for. It's certain things of like, Oh my God, he said that, but he said it standing. No, 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 we need that sitting. Because um, you know you're gonna be sitting. I put myself in the edit room because I'm gonna be sitting in the edit room with Larry and we're, 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 and we're gonna be saying to ourselves, that was hilarious, it doesn't match. Um, and more than that, sometimes there's a hilarious bit and you have to remember, I don't think we have any way to get to that. Like, I don't think we have the setup. So you have to go back and record a setup to it. You have to know um, and, then the other thing that happens a lot is, let's say, I'll use Larry and, and, and J.B. Smooth, Leon are walking out. And as they're walking out and they're walking away from camera and we're on their backs, they start to say something really funny at the door. And then I have to go, are we gonna have, we, should, we gotta go in and cover that. Um, and that's the trick about improv stuff is that someone says something really funny and everyone's laughing. Oh my God, that's the funniest thing that's ever happened. And you have to go, do it again. I need this coverage. Do it again here. I need his side. Do it again, don't overlap it. Like, like, so you have to know in your head um, what you really need. And because things are changing all the time, you just have to have this mental list. And a lot of times too, on the, at, the end of a, at the end of a scene, just going through with a, a singles pass, you go, say this line, say this, try this thing again. We need this little snippet. And you just have to keep crossing these things off. The other thing you have to know how to do is like, they said some, they did this really funny thing but you have to know, I need to be able to get from A to D. Like B and C are both funny. Are they both gonna live in there? I don't know. So you have to know to go through these singles. Or Now I've got this shot that I can go through. So in, you're literally editing as you're going all the time. Um, who's taking that? Like whose role is that? Are you on set saying, okay, we need this amount of that's a collaboration of people? Like how do you make sure there's no one, no one's feet are getting stepped on? Um, that's my job. Like okay. I know what I need. Like. I was there with Larry writing it. I'm here with Larry shooting it and I'm going to be with Larry editing it. So like, I know we need this or that. And by the way, we don't always agree. There'll be things where like, I really want this line and I'll get it like in a take. And he goes, Oh, I don't think we need to, I don't want to go that way. And I go, that's fine. But I know I got it. And then in the edit room, we use it. And I go, well, by the way, you didn't want to do that one. <laughs> but so we're always, there's always, I mean, I'm devious. I'll get, I'll use any trick in the book to get what I really want. Um, <laughs> so. Um, but there's a script supervisor. So often like the poor script supervisor, when something's good, I like, I just tap her. And if I get, it's like, she's basically getting, she's getting like banged on the leg all the time going that, that, cause the dialogue's changing all the time, every scene. Um, and then I'll also say like, I'll have a little list of like, we need this, we need this, we need this. And I'll say to her, remind me, everyone's going to be excited to leave. We have to go back and pick this up because when it's done, you're like, Oh, fine. We got to race to the next scene. And then, she goes, remember you wanted this. Um, and then on the other side of it is the time element, which is the AD looking at you when we're shooting some digression that we're covering. And he's going, we really got to go to lunch. Is this actually going to be in the show? I'm like, yeah, it's going to be in the show. So. Yeah. Sounds fun. Yes, and. Thank you. <laughs> yes, and. Awesome. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you. Uh, that's so funny. The, the job of that script supervi supervisor must keep him busy, <laughs> I'm oh. sure. Um, let's go over to Kelsey Bolig. Kelsey, you are off mute. Hello, everyone. Um, and hi, Jeff. Thank you for taking um, the time to speak to all of us. Um, I just have a question about Eurotrip, to be honest. Um, I believe that was the first movie that you have directed. And I just want to know what about that film attracted you to um, the story and to be a first time director. So the reality of that movie is that Alec, Alec Berg, Dave Mandel, and I, who were a writing team, um, wrote the movie together for all of us to direct. And 
we'd worked together on Seinfeld for a long time. We'd written other movies. We wanted to write a movie. We wrote, a, a, we wrote it as a spec script. We wanted to make a movie like the movies that we grew up watching when we were teenagers. A movie that you could steal your parents' liquor and watch in your friends, your cool friend's basement. Um, and so we wrote the script and we wrote it and people wanted to buy it. So we said, we're gonna direct it. And we had been around enough movies as rewriters and we'd already done, we'd basically done that kind of job as a, when you're a showrunner of a, of a show, you're basically, you're in charge of everything. So you tell the director what to do. Um, so, and then we'd done movie rewrites and helped other directors and we we're like, oh, they don't, if you're not a funny enough director, you're not going to get the joke. So why don't we just do it ourselves? Um, but the DGA would not give us a three man director credit, even though we'd worked together for a long time. So we basically had a, we filmed it, it's on the DVD. Uh, we had a check extra, pull a name out of a hat and we filmed it. It's in it, it's how to pick a director. And we filmed it and put, cause, and so I, I, I drew the straw, so I was named the director, but all three of us really directed it. Um, but yeah, we just wanted to, that was the moment when we realized, oh, to have the, the control that we had in television, if we want to have the control we had in television in movies, we had to be the director. So that's why we, that's why we started directing. Interesting. Well, yeah. thank you. <laughs> thank you, Kelsey. Who knew that's how you choose a director, just pick a name out of a hat. Yeah. Um, By the way, I should say on the seasons of Curb that we were all there, they wouldn't give us the three-man director credit for that either. We were all EP, we were all, you know, we wrote with Larry yeah. and so that was seasons like six, seven, and eight. And so we would make the DGA rep pick the name out of the hat when he came <laughs> by on set. He go, who the director? We go, you're about to determine that. Yeah, a lot of pressure yeah. for him. For some reason that us as a three-person director credit was like, was making a mockery of the director and whatever. It's like, yeah, maybe for Sophie's choice, but not for this. So in an effort for them to protect the director's thing, we made them pick out of the hat and they always did it. Like, this is a bigger joke. What are you doing? Too good, too good. Um, let's go over to Mark Cates. Mark, you are off mute. Hi, um, two questions. One, um, in, the, in the episode where Taco gets three penis wine, what was that actually in the bottle? Um, and two, is Larry going to get an endorsement deal like his own shoe, Air Jordan style from Camper, since he wears those in every single episode? So the shoes he wears, I'll do the last one first. The shoes he wears in almost every episode used to be these th things called simples, and, but they, which went out of business, but he still has a few. Those long laces that never stay tied. Um, but <laughs> people, I was gonna say, there have been many companies have approached Larry to be the spokesperson for them. Um, uh, a lot of different companies that are some of which would have been pretty funny and he has always turned them down he just goes I can't imagine me you know flipping around on the television and seeing me <laughs> I can't and by the way we've done we've like he's entertained it I mean we just had one the other day we were talking about it like two weeks ago and I just go I know how this movie ends we're gonna work on it we're gonna think about it we're gonna come up with something funny and everyone's going to get excited. Then you're going to actually think about doing it. And you're going to go, I'm not going to flip around and see myself on TV. <laughs> so it's never going to happen. Um, in terms of the three penis wine, um, there were a friend of mine who used to do a lot of um, business in East Asia. And he, he ran into a guy who, in New Zealand, there's a lot of uh, deer. And they use basically every part of the deer except the penis is sort of left over. And then they realized they could sell the penis and make in this three penis wine for aphrodisiac in, in China. And so um, there's, there's a three penis wine, there's a five penis wine, there's a nine penis wine. Uh, um, there are, depending on your, I guess, appetite uh, for it. So um, what was in there, whatever it was, because I still have a few bottles, um, has degenerated. <laughs> And it's now just this sort of very dirty water with a lot. It looks like a filter fish. Wow. <laughs> I'll have to look that up. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Um, let's go on over to Sarah Levine for the next question. Sarah, you are off mute. Hey, Jeff. Hi. 
I was wondering if there's an experience or a job that you wish you had when you were younger that would have helped you in your job now. I think you're actually asking the question the wrong way. I think okay. every job and experience I had when I was younger is what I'm writing now. Um, like being in a, my high school experiences are what are what are the basis for the league. And um, there's so many different things that have, that ha you just remember these things and you put them in the show. That's what, that's what this kind of writing is, is, you know, Larry and I get together and show each other our awkward scars, you know, or with Dave, or it's just, you have these experiences. So it's not, it's not, there's never one specific thing because that would be um, boring. It would be one note, right? It's everything. And you just have to be able to look back and harness all of these different experiences and strange things people did. And, oh, I remember this guy. And like, you know, I mean, it's just, it's every little thing. It's the, I mean, I remember the, the janitor guy at my dorm would just, you just go, how you doing? And if two people walked by, it was, how you doing? How you doing? And if three people, it was, how you doing? How, everybody got a, how you doing? No matter how many people there were, it, you know, it's things like, that. I don't know why I'm just, that just popped into my head, but I'm just saying like, it's all of those things are these little strange life nuances and still using them, used them on Seinfeld, used them on league, still using them on curb. They don't always fit. You don't know where they go. You just keep them and you drag them with you like a bag of moldy apples and you pull it out and go, is this one going to work? I don't know. So, um, and sometimes show, ideas take like, like years to like, you figure out, oh, if I combine this with this, that'll actually work. So just write it all down. You've got notes, you've got a notes thing on your phone. Keep yeah. all those weird little things. You never know when you're gonna use them. Awesome, thank you. Welcome. That's great, thank you, Sarah. Um, next up, let's go to Isaac Nunez. You are, hold on. There you go. You're off mute. Hey, Jeff. How you doing? Good. Hey, right on. Um, for someone that's new, I guess you could say, what's the best advice you would give to fresh actors coming from a different, completely background? I mean, I really love what you just said, how every job you had prior was definitely where you're at now that led you to this moment now. I mean, there's, I mean, here's the thing. The most difficult part I find for, this is me personally having not being an actor, but working with tons of actors, the hardest part is not being able to make your own luck, I think, and not being able, and I think, so my advice is always, if you can make something, like if you can make something or do something, do it, um, okay. that, that can showcase yourself. Like, don't wait around for someone to save you. Gotcha. Right, put yourself in a position, like build the bonfire and make an SOS out of coconuts, like do something, right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, if, if you have an idea, um, work with people to try and make it so. By the way, you may, not even, you may not have an idea. That may not be your strength, and that's totally fine. Like, are there people you know that you like that are making something? Can I be in that? Yeah. What can I, I mean, like, you can make a reel now. Gotcha. You can make something that has impact that can be shown to anybody you want in the world anytime. So, you, again, you don't have to be the creator. There's plenty of amazing actors who who aren't writers and they're not directors, but they're great actors. Gotcha. So find, I guess, find your team or like find some people that you can make things with so that you can make your own reel. Yeah, okay. No, that, make, that makes complete sense. By the way, I love, I love your show, Dave. Uh, it was awesome. Okay. Yeah, I love the vulnerability. Definitely felt it and that was what really drawn me to that. Um, yeah, but yeah, I appreciate that feedback. It meant a lot. More than welcome, good luck. No, thank you. All right, thank you, Isaac. Next up, let's go to Tess Speranza. Tess, you are off mute. Hi. Um, I know that this industry can be kind of difficult and it's sometimes hard to keep pushing to follow your dreams. And I was wondering if there was ever a time that you wanted to give up and what it was that uh, kept you going. That beautiful man next to you. Oh, Joey. It was me? Thank you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll tell you, it's weird. Um, right before, so, okay. So 
worked on a whole bunch, like I was saying before, this is a long time ago, right after the earth was formed and then I got a job on Seinfeld. So it's a, that's a long time ago, but there was a, we were working on a show called Herman's Head for 13 weeks after this Jeff Garland thing collapsed. We were under contract, but we went to New York when Conan first started in New York. This is again, a long time ago. Um, we had to come back to LA uh, in the spring because Herman's Head was coming back and we were under contract, but it didn't get picked up. So we're sitting there like, oh, well, we're in LA. Let's see if we can get, so we lived in LA. Let's see if we can get another job. Got hired on a show and we were excited. And then the showrunners basically told us, I'm sorry, we don't have the money to hire you. We thought we had the money to hire you, so you're unhired. And we're like, well, that sucks. And, but that was, we had also submitted ideas to these people at Seinfeld and basically we're like, that sucks. We're guess we'll go back to Conan, which wasn't like a consolation, but we thought we'd be in LA. And we got, they read our stuff and liked it and said, can you come in for a meeting? So I ran into the, the showrunner, the guy who unhired us. I've run into him since and he says, the best thing that ever happened to you is me not hiring you. <laughs> wow. So you, you don't know how it's going to work out and you can't only control what you can control, which is your stuff. Yeah. So just, I mean, you just got to keep working, honestly. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. That's great. Thank you, Tess. Um, we, ha we have time for two more questions. I'm going to go to Sean Riley, followed by Tanya Todd. Um, so just so you know, those are our final two. Thanks everyone for joining us. Sean, you are off mute. Hey Jeff, uh, thanks for taking the time. Uh, uh, big fan of uh, Curve and the League. Um, my, uh, my roommate here and I and a few other people, were, uh, we actually just finished writing a pilot for a, a TV, a, a sitcom, 22 Minutes. And um, you know, we're about to approach uh, some networks with uh, the help of an agent that we, that we hired. And we're just wondering, you know, what's the, uh, do you have any advice uh, for going through that process? And maybe uh, if you could speak to your process going through with uh, selling the league and, uh, you know, conveying your commitment to the story and just uh, in that space, if you had any advice, we'd really appreciate it. Um, well, a few things. About the show that you're going out with, Make sure I would have more than just the pilot meaning you don't have to write other scripts, but have a sense of where it's going um, a little bit and not, I don't care about season two or three. That's don't worry about that. It's just the idea of like, Hey, this is where it starts. Here's how we see the season. Um, just so you can talk about it intelligently. Cause that would be my first question as an executive, where's this headed? And it may be obvious. I don't have it read it. So I don't know. It may be obvious from the end of this, the last two pages. It may not be. Um, but um, and then the other thing, what you can do in between that is once, when that one is out is keep working on something else, mm -hmm. right? Because sometimes you'll get into a situation where, hey, I read that, I think the writing is good. I don't really, I don't wanna do that show. I don't like that concept or I have something just like it. What else do you have? And be nice for you to then to say, well, I was thinking about this show. It doesn't, again, you don't have to have the script yet, but, it's better to have at least two scripts, I would say for sure, or get there. And it's, it's also nice to have some arrows in your quiver that you can say, I was also thinking about doing a show about this. I love this. This area is very interesting to me and I see it like this. And then go, you know what? That is really interesting to me. Why don't we come in and keep talking about it? Um, because a lot of times your, your spec scripts are two things, right? First and foremost, they're a writing sample. It's a calling card. You're saying, here's how I write. What do you think? And if it's a movie, they're just taking the idea. You could be a brain in a jar. It doesn't matter because they're going to take it. We're going to give it to somebody else. We're going to give it to somebody else. I need that idea. For a TV show, the person is looking at you, if they're the showrunner or something going, can I spend more time with this person than I do with my wife? Is this person going to be helpful to me in the room? Um, so you want to make, so that's another thing, which is just personality wise, like, hey, here I am. I'm ready to help. Cause, and I think this actually across the board for anything, what I tell everybody is the best way to think about the other people that you're meeting with or that you want to meet with, they're all thinking the exact same thing. How can you help me? Right? I'm a showrunner. How can you help me? I got to finish this stuff. I'm, how am I going to get this done? You're an agent. How can he help me? Can I sell this guy? So you have to say, and here's why I'm sell or a manager. Here's why I'm saleable. I know I've met these people on my own. I like this. I've got this idea for this. I know this person. Like you just, you always have to be thinking, put yourself in their shoes and all they want to do is know how you can help them. So how you can help your agent 
is by having this one thing that's fleshed out, but also having a few other things ready or things that I'm working on or things that I can talk about. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, that's, I don't know, is that helpful? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And just a, a, a quick follow up. Um, would it, uh, would they be interested in uh, a film produced pilot? Like if we self produced the pilot, would that uh, show commitment or going too far? Would, would you perceive that as a, as a weakness or a strength to come with a producer? Um, I don't pilot? know if you have the whole thing. I mean, here's the thing. Showing something is easier. No one likes reading. <laughs> nobody nobody right. wants to. Showing something is interesting, but at the same time, you have to make sure you're saying, hey, this is a proof of concept. It's not these actors. It's not this thing. Because no one, unless it's so amazing, no one's going to say, yeah, I'll take that and put it on NBC. Yeah. It, it's, so you, I wouldn't knock yourself out. Do, like, do a shorter version. Do, I mean, if there's something you can do that's short that proves that it's funny, almost like a sizzle reel or something, I don't know. But like, it's, mm -hmm. it's okay to have a calling card that shows what you're trying to do, but you also don't want to, you want to make clear that you're saying it doesn't have to be that. Because okay. you have to leave room for people who wanna, that are buying it to want to put their stamp on it, develop it, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Also, how was the orange? Good. Was it good? Okay. Yeah. Good. <laughs> All right. Cool. Um, well, thank you so much, Jeff. You're welcome. Appreciate right, it. Thank you, Sean, and good, good luck with the, uh, with the pilot. Um, so our final question of the evening will be Tanya Todd here. And Tanya, you are off mute. Hi, thank you for choosing my question. And thank you, Jeff, for doing this. I appreciate it. No worries. My, my question has to do with, let's say you do have a script, you have interest in it, someone wants to purchase it. How do you go about negotiating that you want to be the person to direct that script? So that's a sliding scale of their interest, right? Okay. So, so, and there's ways that you can slide, you can go like, hey, I'll, I'll write it and sell it for almost nothing, but I want to direct it. Or, I mean, because what they have to think about, right, the person that's buying it has to think about what, just to put yourself in their shoes for a second, like, I want to make this product, what's going to make the best product? And mm -hmm. how, and for a price. So if there's, the best way to ensure, I mean, to be honest, the best way to ensure that you can direct it is to have more than one person interested in it. And you have leverage. Okay. Um, without that leverage, you're relying on someone seeing that you're passionate about it and that you're qualified or simple goodwill, um, which doesn't exist. So, so going back to qualified and that stuff, one, shoot a scene or two that shows that you know what you're doing. And again, I'm, I don't, I haven't seen any of your stuff. So I don't know, like you may have a directing reel already. I don't know, but like you have to give it's the easiest fallback is no. So, and you know, you have to give them a reason to want to say yes. Okay. Um, that reason can be, well, she'll sell it to us for half the price if we let her direct it. Um, or it can be the only way we're going to get it is if we let her direct it, or it can be, boy, this is such per personal material. She really knows this stuff. Who better to direct it than her? So you can choose any of these adventures, but, um, but if you want to, ins but, or all of them, frankly, um, you know, which is shoot a little something to prove that you can do it or show them something that you have directed. Again, I don't know if you have or not. Um, tell them why you're the perfect person. And ideally, if someone else is interested too, so you can go, look, I'd love to do it with you guys, but they're gonna let me direct. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Thank you very much. Welcome. Good awesome. luck. Yes, Thank you. Yes, Sonia. Um, all right, well, that is all we have time for today. Jeff, thank you so much for your time. And I know I speak for everyone in here. Uh, your insight has been pretty invaluable. It's been great to uh, have your ear and your brain for a moment. Thanks for, thanks for spending time with us. We really appreciate it. I am always happy to share all of my mistakes with everyone. <laughs> mistakes to learn from and successes to learn from as well. Yeah. Um, thank and, you. Yeah, thank you. And uh, for everyone else, uh, this was recorded. We will be uploading it to YouTube um, at a later date. If we didn't get to your question tonight, then uh, we are always hosting these uh, pretty much uh, two, three times a week now. So. Uh, get in next time and uh, we'll, we'll make it happen. But thank you everyone for tuning in. I'm Benjamin Lindsay, Managing Editor here, and uh, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.